Hi, I'm Tom Benita, a senior game designer at Intercept Games, and today we're talking about celestial bodies. <laughs> Great. We'll keep the laughter, just in case. I'm doing a crash course online, trying to trying to learn as much as I can about electric propulsion for spacecraft before we go meet, so that I don't sound like a complete noob. Oh, I think you found him. Howdy! Hey. I don't know if they're gonna make me like just like I did you the first time. Thank you. Thanks for I have played Kerbal Space Program. I've learned that there are an effectively infinite amount of anomalies and mysteries out there in our galaxy. Even the weirdest stuff you've ever heard of, raining diamonds on, on this planet or this other planet that has a desert on one side and a an arctic hellscape on the on the other and ocean in between there's always something weirder around the corner we add things to the planet's cliffs or or large canyons and you know a lot of those things can have geological history that explain why they're there. We try our best to have everything we, we do with the planets rooted in, in true science, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that traversing these planets is, is interesting with local space scatter, which is things like trees and rocks and things of that nature. That can be used as a tool to make terrain easier to navigate or, or harder to navigate based on how challenging design wants that planet to be. Additionally, like the size of the planet, whether or not it has atmosphere, that can all completely change the dynamic and how a player approaches the planet. We've been focusing on uh, scatter. The players haven't seen this scale of scatter from KSP-1, so we're excited to show off. I think that's really neat with what we're doing is the density of what you can see with like scatter, like. You look at like photographs of the moon, for example, and you see just fields of like rocks that are on the ground. We can achieve something like that. The planets are cool. Everyone's gonna like the planets. They're gonna be the driving factor, I think, for exploration in this game. There's a huge variety. There's just a lot of motivation to go explore with your spacecraft because of the planets. So planets are rad. I'm really excited about what we've come up with for, for a lot of these planets. The joke is right in the in the loading screen for, for Kerbal Space Program 1. They have a quote during the loading screen, hey, we're doing this, we're doing that, that just says, never visiting dress. Because why would you? It's just a rock. Well, now it's got a really cool mountain range. And we're going to stash some goodies on that mountain range, maybe, probably. Uh, <laughs> Can't get into specifics there. We don't ever want to say you never visit this planet or this moon. We want there to be a reason, something for you to discover on every single celestial body in Kerbal Space Program 2. Part of that is going deep into how did these celestial bodies come into existence? What is their history? And how does that impact how they look and how they feel now. Uh, okay, I really like Jewel because it's it's a celestial body where you're on its moons. It has all these moons, and when you're on them, you can see it really clearly. It's always right above you. That's something that isn't really the case for a lot of the other planets. A lot of the other planets, like if you're on Duna's moon or uh, you're on Minmus, like you can see Kerbin and you can see the other planets, but they're so far away. And Jewel is just so massive that on, you know, if you're on Lathe, you, you just see it. We just announced the existence of a new celestial body called Gardama. It's a planet in the Deb Deb system. The Deb Deb system is a young star system, and Gardama is a young terrestrial planet that is somewhat inspired by what Earth looked like during the Hidean Eon, which is 
close to four billion years ago, soon after its formation. The solar system at that time was a very tumultuous place. The Earth during the Hittian Eon was, was undergoing something called the late heavy bombardment, where it was getting hit by debris constantly. It was a cratered hellscape. In fact, that was the era during which the moon was created via a collision with another planetoid. And so Gurdama is, a, a, is our opportunity to give you a little bit of a window into what Earth was like at that time. We call it a proto-Kerbin because it's roughly the size of Kerbin, but what Kerbin would have looked like long, long ago. It has an atmosphere, but it doesn't have oxygen. It is extremely cratered, but there is also water that's beginning to appear. It has recently undergone a collision with another planetoid and had its moon created as a result of that collision, but there is also a residual planetary ring out of which that moon is currently being coalesced. So it's a really, really unique celestial body. It's really speaking to the violence of its current situation. But I love that when I'm walking around on Gurdama, I'm also getting a little bit of the taste of what it would be like to walk around on the Earth billions of years ago. We were trying to think of a, the, a name for the um, moon of Gurdama, and I couldn't, I was just in a random meeting with our multiplayer designer, and he was like, what are we calling it? And I was like, I don't know, for now, just call it Donk. And then it, now it's still Donk. <laughs> like, I think, I think we're just shipping with Donk. It feels like concept to gameplay is, is a very high level of iteration between design and art. Like, if, in some ways, there's, there's some story, right? You're like, this is a star system. This is the story of, of this particular star. These are the kinds of planets that would be around this star. And so you kind of get like, here, here's the basics of it. And then art gets in there and they're like, I'm going to make this cool as hell and kind of add all these nice little bits to go find. And, and you're like, okay, this is neat. And so like, we may be responsible early on as design for like, here, here are the orbital challenges of just trying to intercept this thing versus like here are some of the physical characteristics of this planet that may make it a challenge to navigate through and then art goes in and says like here are all the cool places that you can go to that plays actually into our science system as well in ksp you can go to various biomes and perform experiments get science and use that to find new parts and we started working with art to make sure that we were tying biomes to like these really distinct locations that they've been putting their heart soul into. We had the biggest argument about the moon Minmus from the original Kerbalor system. You know, it had to be shiny and at least initially icy on the surface, but had to be at about Earth's distance from the sun. That is flat out not going to happen. And we went through every kind of uh, possible fix. We tried to change the ice composition. We tried to dope the ice so that it was melting at a higher temperature. We couldn't get the temperatures anywhere near the level needed for that planet. We tried to make it temporary, like from an impact, but then it would have to be streaming off from the back. And there's no evidence of that happening in this object. So that didn't work either. Finally, after Googling around on the internet for different kinds of structures and clath rates, uh, we were you know, going through the same research papers together. We settled on making it glassy. So it's not icy anymore, it's glassy. And that's really cool. It's going to be you know, ceramic planets are a real possibility, at least very interesting possibility. And so now this kind of represents one of the more exotic kind of objects that you might encounter. My favorite body, Scoot, this weirdly shaped non-spherical thing that is very difficult to land on, that the ends might toss you back off into orbit if you travel to those two body systems like Rask and Rust, where you have to contend with two different gravitational points that are pulling you in different directions as you travel between them, or even in the space that's near between them, and how that affects your trajectory through that system or even landing on one of those. I think this makes things a lot more challenging and a lot more interesting to players who are both fans of KSP-1 and who are coming to us new for KSP-2. For planets, we have kind of two versions in KSP-2. We have a scaled space version, which a player is generally gonna see from in orbit or kind of when they're far away from the planet. And then we have a separate version of the planet that is more, much more detailed that we use for local space, which basically means when you get on the surface of the planet. For the artists who create this local space planet, we have a tool that gives them the control to specify the height of the planet across the whole entire planet, as well as what the textures look like, how they're all combined, and some procedural controls for when to spawn objects for different slopes, for example, or 
you know, at peaks of this planet, I want to have it snowy or at uh, crevices of the planet, I want a bunch of rocks, things like that. On top of that, they have a separate tool that they're essentially placing decals on this planet for features that are big enough that our players should be able to see from space. And so an artist within our tool set can place a decal at a location, which will then affect the height, the textures, how that planet looks at that position from all distances. A lot of my job is providing artists with tools to create a, the kind of general feel of a planet. So when a player is playing the game and really close to a planet, we only render the small part of the planet that we care about, and we render that to a high level of detail. And then farther away, for example, the opposite side of the planet, no one can even see that, so we don't render that. Then as the player gets farther away from the planet, we render a different version that's more efficient. Um, so that helps the player kind of have a seamless gameplay transition from out in space all the way up to a meter away from the planet. To enable that to happen, we just need to make sure we're optimizing what textures we're using where and efficiently streaming in data and streaming out data as needed. The first time you kind of fly from outer space into the atmosphere of a planet and down to the ground of that planet and just see the visual quality kind of transitions from space where you see the atmosphere and then as you're transitioning in, you're kind of entering that atmosphere and you see uh, the atmospheric scatter in the air from that. And then as you get closer, you're seeing the detail of, you know, terrain scatter, like rocks and trees and things kind of fade in. I feel like players will visually be in awe a little bit. I was in awe at seeing some of these planets that the artist created for the first time. What's your favorite one? What's my favorite celestial body? Yeah, can I try to guess? Go is for it, it. Is it Gloomo? It is. <laughs> it's Gloomo. Gloomo is, is a sort of Saturn equivalent that's over in Dub Dub. Uh, and so it's got like this neat double ring. It's a big gas giant. It's also got like some shepherd moon sitting in the ring as well. When I first joined the project, I came on, I think as we were starting to go through these celestial bodies and Glumo came up on a show and tell. And I, I saw like this beautiful shot of Glumo and he saw the rings and I was like, this is a prog rock cover. Like <laughs> I could, this could have like a, a wizard on like a cybernetic unicorn and it'd be, totally makes sense and I fell in love with it. I do have more questions I'd like to ask. Do you have to build your own instrumentation? Like is it like prior to the There are some vistas in KSB2, like the rings of Oven seen from the solid surface of the planet. It is a ringed super earth. And that's not a thing you've seen before. What it looks like to look at a planetary ring from below, the way it arcs across the sky. Um, but it is certainly a thing that exists in the universe that we haven't seen in our solar system. And I think there are a lot of uh, experiences like that in KSP2, where uh, you might be stunned by um, the uniqueness of something that you've seen and then potentially be inspired by the realization that it is a thing that almost certainly exists somewhere in the real universe. It is really critical for people of all stripes to be interested in learning about how space works, how exploration works, and how science works. So I think there's some real low-hanging fruit in having more broad audiences understand space. Because you never know what you're going to be interested in until you try it.